I'm so glad that you're here today. It's my prayer that you, we would all experience the presence of God as he changes our lives. And just as a reminder, we are one church with three locations. So today we want to welcome our McCulloch campus. Thank you so much for uh, being there at McCulloch. We pray that God would bless and move among you as we pray that God will move among us here as well. Uh, I want to remind you at Calvary, we are here for you. And you hear us say that often, but the reality is uh, with uh, our, our pastor's leadership, with the leadership of others here on our campus, we love you. We're here for you. And we understand that none of us are living our lives the way that we should. And sometimes there's baggage from the past and sometimes there's hurt from the past. We want to help you. We want to help you navigate through your marriage, navigate through your, uh, through your life, through your retirement season, whatever it is that we can do to help you. We want to help you because we believe that that's what God has called us here to do is to pastor and to shepherd and to love and to be honest, right? And to be honest with you as you're honest with us. We're for your marriage. We are for your family. Uh, we are for your future. We want you to experience everything that God has planned for you. Today, we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, or page 960 uh, under, in the Bible underneath the seat in front of you. If you don't have a Bible, as always, please reach underneath the seat in front of you. Take that Bible, use it, read it, take it home with you. Let it be our Christmas gift for you. And above everything, don't just read it, but apply it to your life. We believe that if you apply it to your life, you really will experience life change. So many of us come to church and we are, are, maybe we're sad, maybe we're lonely, maybe we're depressed, maybe we don't feel like anybody cares for us, anybody really loves us, maybe we have distance from our families. We want you to know God loves you unconditionally. If you apply his word to your life, he's going to work in every one of your relationships changing them, bringing restoration, reconciliation where needed, and a lot of joy because our God is a joyful God. Have you ever wondered or noticed how two people can hear the very same sermon, the very same message, whether it's on TV, whether it's on the radio, whether it's even a worship song, they hear the very same message and they walk away with two completely different Thoughts. Have you ever noticed that? A husband and wife can wake up in the same bed. They can eat the same breakfast. They can drink the same pot of coffee. They can drive in the same car to church. And one can leave radically changed and the other maybe not so much. The other kind of in the same state as they were when they came as well. That's happened to my wife and I before. It's happened a number of times before. I recall one time we were listening together in a sermon. We were listening to the sermon. And at the close of that sermon, my wife jumped up and she uh, went forward and she was crying and she was weeping and she was having a moment with God, moved in brokenness with tears. And I'm sitting back going... The sermon wasn't that good. You ever notice that? You ever notice how it seems like God can be speaking to somebody's heart and somebody's life, and it can be the very two people who are very close to one another and maybe not in your heart at all. Has that ever happened to you? Uh, maybe your spouse was challenged and moved by a sermon, and you think about the sermon, eh, it's not you know, that great. So let me ask you a question. Raise your hand if that's happened to you before. Well, see me after church. No, I'm just kidding. Why is that? Why is it that it seems that one person can walk away changed and another person leaves unchanged? It's the same passage of scripture. It's, they heard it at the same time. They heard it in the same place. They heard it with the same worship songs. Uh, they heard the same person preach the very same message why would God change one life and not another's? So today we're going to answer that question. As I read Matthew chapter 2, 1 through 12, take note of the people that could have potentially experienced life change. They could have potentially experienced the life-changing grace of God, and yet they did not. Matthew chapter 2, or on page 960, Matthew chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. 
Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, and the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel." Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So it's a lot of scripture that we just read. It's a, it's a lot of scripture. What we're going to do now is we're going to unpack it a little bit. When King Herod heard from the wise men that the king of the Jews had been born, he turned to the right people. He turned to ask for guidance from the uh, chief priests and the scribes. Now, the chief priests were basically what the pastors do at the church. They kind of manage the schedule of things that were happening at the temple. Okay, that's what the chief priests did. And it was their responsibility to lead their synagogues. The scribes were essentially lawyers that interpreted the Old Testament law. Okay, they were lawyers that sat back, they looked at the Old Testament law, they interpreted it, they spent hours debating, studying, and agonizing about what was right and what was wrong according to Jewish law. These two groups of people knew their Old Testament scripture. There was no section that was left unturned in their studies and in their teaching King Herod turned to the right people for guidance. Oh, the king of the Jews is going to be born. The Messiah, the savior of the world is going to be born. I need to know about this. So he turned to the right people. And it wasn't just Herod, but all Jerusalem looked to these chief priests and scribes as their religious leaders. They looked to them for knowledge when it came to the birth of Jesus and the religious leaders, see what they did. They offered knowledge without instruction. And that's because religious people know where to find Jesus, but they do not go to him. These religious leaders, they knew that Old Testament. They knew that the king of kings was going to be born in Bethlehem. And they were able to unfold that information to all of Jerusalem and to King Herod. They knew the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. They knew precisely where he, this baby king was going to be born, out of what city. They knew he would be the shepherd who would be the greatest shepherd of all the shepherds that have ever lived on the face of the earth. They knew where to find Jesus. They had all sorts of head knowledge. They had accurate information. But notice those scribes and, and chief priests, they didn't pack up their bags and go to find Jesus. They could have joined the three uh, kings, the three wise men in their search, in their quest. But they didn't do that. They didn't pack their bags. They didn't join the journey. There was no application over the scripture that they knew. And I can honestly tell you, as a pastor, I can relate to that. 
not because of people coming to me for counseling, but because of my own life. I have studied theology books. I've read through the Bible multiple times. I've memorized scripture passages. I know the basics on resisting temptation. I know the basics and the power of prayer and what genuine prayer can do and how it can transform a life. I understand how to maintain discipline in walking with God and enjoying his presence. I understand how to live with joy. I understand what the Bible says to live with hope. I know how to share the gospel using every evangelistic tool that's ever been created. I know how to treat my wife. I know how to raise my children. I know how to love my, labor as, my neighbor as myself. I know how to love God with all my heart. Yet with all that head knowledge, I fail in each and every one of those areas almost every single day. I know what it is to have head knowledge about how to live and yet often fail at the application. It might be because I fail fail because I'm fearful. It might be because I, I lack faith. It might be because I'm just stubborn and resist what God wants me to do. I know what I ought to do and I often do not do it. There are passages of, the, of, of, of Scripture in the New Testament I have yet to apply to my life. I do not pray as often as I ought to. I do not live with joy and hope as often as I ought to. I do not treat my wife and my family as I ought to all the time. I do not forgive like I ought to forgive all the time. I know what the Bible teaches on all of those issues, and I find myself settling for knowledge yet failing to apply God's word to my own life. I have become more religious than I feel comfortable with. What about you? What about you? If you're a follower of Jesus, if you've given your life to God by receiving Jesus as your Savior, if you've committed your life and you become a follower of Jesus Christ— Are you following Jesus like you ought to? Now, I've been honest with you. You be honest with me. Raise your hand if you have knowledge of how the New Testament wants you to live, but you fail to apply it often in your life. See, we're we're so close to becoming religious people if we know the truth as the chief priests and the scribes understood the truth, but we're not willing to apply it to our lives because you and I know there is great joy when we walk doing what God has called us to do. And that we have to overcome fear. We have to, uh, we have to walk in faith. Maybe we have, to, we have trust issues. Whatever it is, we need to do what I want to challenge you to do. What I did as I prayed and prepped and, and prayed through this message for today. I want to encourage you to do one simple thing, and it starts with an R, and that word is repent. Just stop not applying God's word to your life. Join me in repenting from knowing what to do and not doing it because you know that if we don't do as followers of Jesus, if we are not living and doing what we know the Bible teaches us to do and we become okay with it, right? If we become okay with it, then we're leading people into a religion and not into a relationship with Jesus. And then we're going to become uh, guarded and we're not going to let people in to discover all of our weaknesses, all of our frailties, all of our faults, because we'll begin to think that we've got to have this right image out there as the chief priests and the scribes had to have. And instead of having uh, genuine friendships and genuine uh, a community among people, among followers of Jesus, where we share our hurts and we share our pains and we share our struggles, we put that wall up. And we miss out on that relationship with them that's real, that's meaningful, that's, that's lasting. And we miss out on that relationship with God that could be as good, that's not as good as we want it to be. You and I know better than anybody else that knowing about God is not the same as knowing God. The chief priests, the scribes, the religious leaders all knew about God, but they did not attempt to know him personally. They knew where the king of kings was going to be born. 
They were even able to give the, the King Herod instructions so that then King Herod was able to relate to the wise men who were seeking after Jesus. They were able to, to give him detail on where he would be born, yet those scribes and Pharisees were unwilling to pack up their own bags and follow. They settled for knowing about God, not knowing God personally. The whole purpose of Jesus coming to this earth and being born as a human was so that all humans everywhere on the planet could know God personally. In fact, when Jesus described eternal life, he described it as knowing God and knowing him personally. Jesus said in John 17, 3, and this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one that you sent to this earth. When Jesus described eternal life, he described it in, in context of a personal relationship about knowing God. If you want to know God, if you want to experience eternal life, it comes by personally knowing God, according to the words of Jesus, and knowing Jesus Christ. See, knowing about God is not enough. Knowing about Jesus' birth, knowing about his life, his teachings, his death, his burial, his resurrection, the ascension, his forgiveness, knowing about all those things is not enough. See, God could have declared forgiveness by a decree. He could have declared all people everywhere forgiven for their sin. But what we see through Jesus is a personal God, a God who personally became human, who walked and talked and hurt and laughed and cried and experienced joy with his people, with his followers and with the people that he encountered. God chose to know us personally. Could God have made a decree that all people everywhere be forgiven? Yeah, he could have done that. But he knew what the very best thing for us as human beings was in our lives is to have a God that we know personally who is our refuge, who is our hope, who is our joy, who is our king that we can turn to in times of weakness, that we can turn to in times of hurt and pain and burdens and that he would talk to us, he would communicate to us and he would answer our prayer. See, God chose the very best path for us to know God personally, to know Jesus personally, to experience forgiveness personally. The best path for you and I is to simply know God personally. Doesn't that cause your heart to erupt with joy that the creator, the king of kings, the Lord of lords wants to know you? And maybe that you've experienced a, a abuse in your past or maybe you had a difficult childhood and maybe you don't think that you're really lovable or that you're really worthy of God's love. God loves you. He wants you to know him personally. He already knows the hair on your head. He already knows your thoughts before you even think them. He, he, he formed you in your mother's womb. God already knows you and he wants you to experience the blessing of a relationship with him. That is life changing. See, we're not forgiven by some distant, uncaring, apathetic God who really doesn't think about us that often and really doesn't care about us personally. We don't just have this blanket God that just kind of says, hey, you know, come to me if you want to. All of you are weary and heavy. It doesn't matter to me if you do or not. We have a God that personally knows our name that personally designed us and gifted us and created us, that God calls a masterpiece that loves you. See, we are forgiven by a God who desires that we know him personally because he loves us. But Herod and all Jerusalem, they reacted differently to this message this message that there was going to be a king of kings and a Messiah that was going to come to the earth, they responded differently. 
And if this was the only part of the wise men's story that we read, we would say, well, King Herod didn't sound like that big, bad a guy. He, he called the three wise men to him and said, hey, tell me about when you find him. This is where he's located, according to the Old Testament. Uh, when you find him, come back and tell me so that I can go and worship him. And we think, well, that's not that big a deal. But if we read on a few verses later in verse 16, when the Magi, when the three wise men didn't show back up, what did Herod do? He ordered the death of every child in Bethlehem and the surrounding area under the age of two. Herod was a bad guy. He was troubled about this God that wanted to know him personally as well. A personal God-troubled herald. He was deeply troubled about the news that there would be a Messiah, a Savior of the world that had been born. Because if the Messiah had indeed been born, they were all about to experience drastic life change. He was troubled, deeply troubled, and disturbed by the truth that if the Messiah had come, he feared his life would change too much. Would he take over from him? What would his life look like? And so he wanted to do everything he could to not apply the truth to his life. And I can relate to that. As I've already confessed to you, I I confess that I often have to ask myself the question, Am I troubled about Jesus or am I trusting in Jesus? When I read the New Testament and when I read about the life of Jesus and when I read about the path that God has planned for me, I can honestly tell you sometimes it's troubling. It's troubling sometimes to me to walk in faith. It's troubling to me to walk in love, to forgive those who are hurtful to me, to show grace and to show kindness and to show uh, love and compassion to those who care nothing about me. I'm troubled often because I also know my own failures. I know that there are things that I ought to be doing, not to earn forgiveness, but because I've received forgiveness, because I've experienced life change, I I know how I ought to live And it troubles me that I do not do what I ought to do. But rather than being troubled by my failures, God does not desire me to be troubled by my failures. And he does not want you to be troubled by your failures either. God simply desires for me and for you to trust him. Trust that Jesus loves you when you feel unlovable. Trust that Jesus comforts you when you feel troubled. Trust that Jesus will carry you through difficulties. Trust that Jesus will complete the work that he began in you when you became a follower of Jesus. Is your life perfect? No, but God is at work in your heart perfecting you. Trust that Jesus protects you. Trust that Jesus is your refuge and your strength. Trust that he is, that his mighty power is at work within you. Trust that Jesus suffered great grief so that you could experience great peace in your life. Trust that Jesus was crucified so you could live forever. See, trusting God is living with the confidence that he loves you unconditionally that no matter what you've done no matter who you've hurt no matter what hurt you've experienced god loves you unconditionally trust in that because when we trust that he really loves us we're not going to be afraid to walk in obedience because we know that god is going to protect us and he's going to lead us and even if difficulties come our way it's to strengthen us and to develop character in us trust that god has your best best life for you if you follow him and walk and obedience. Trust that he is good, that he has the power to help you, and that he wants to help you. He has never given up on you. He has never turned his back on you. He loves you unconditionally, and he wants to know you personally. It's when we trust 
we live accepting and experiencing on a daily basis this simple truth. No Jesus, no change. No Jesus, no change. See, if you, ha- if you want to experience the life-changing presence of Jesus in your life, that means you have to open up your heart and be willing to be known by God. You have to be willing to know God. You have to be willing to say, I am going to allow you, God, to invade my life. I want you to change me. I want you to make me the man or the woman of God that you've called me to be. And it can be a little bit uncomfortable. But the reality is we can know about Jesus and not experience any change in our life. We can understand the mystery of the gospel. We can understand every theological point about the resurrection of Jesus and about new life that we have in him. But if we don't accept Jesus as our Savior, we will never experience life change. Our character won't change. I mean, you might get better at, 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 at being a person by simply attending church, but you'll never experience grace and forgiveness that can rock your world and change your heart and transform your mind unless you know Jesus personally. See, knowing where to find Jesus is not the same thing as finding Jesus. Attending church religiously is not the same thing as receiving Jesus as your Savior. I under, as a child, I grew up, I heard about Jesus, I attended church, I understood about how everything about the cross and about forgiveness, but it wasn't until I was 18 years old that it clicked in my heart and I understood I've never received Jesus as my Savior. I've never asked Him for forgiveness. I've never asked Him to enter into my life and change me. But when I decided to know Jesus, K-N-O-W, it's when I experienced genuine change. It's when I experienced new life. It's when I experienced hope and peace and joy and forgiveness. It's when my life absolutely changed. At Calvary, we talk about life change all the time. How is it that a husband and wife can hear the same message and one leave unchanged? The religious leaders read about Jesus. Herod heard about Jesus. The Magi heard about Jesus. And they were the only ones that heard God's word and applied it to their life. They listened to where the Bible said Jesus would be found and they went to him. Without Jesus, you will stay the same husband, the same son, the same wife, the same daughter, you will stay the same grandparent, you will stay the same person without Jesus. But with Jesus, with Jesus, you will be a forgiver. You will love deeply. You'll be willing to to walk in faith, not by sight. You'll become generous. Uh, You'll become like Jesus not only to your family and to your friends, but you'll begin to view yourself the way that Jesus views you. Your life will change with Jesus as your Savior and Lord. You will experience peace and mercy. I can think of no greater gift for you to receive this Christmas than receiving the free gift of salvation from Jesus Christ. Paul said in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I had understood everything about Jesus except how he applied to my life. Romans 10, 9 says it very clear. If, You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. And when you're saved, you become a new person. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Old life has passed away. 
all things have become new. The greatest gift that you could give yourself, the greatest gift that you could give your family is a personal relationship with God. Understanding the truth and accepting the truth by applying it to your life. If you want to leave changed, if you want to leave transformed, if you want to end 2019 with a personal relationship with God, surrender your life to Jesus and apply his truth to your life. It's so simple, but it's so life-changing. At the close of our service, uh, we're going to have our prayer counselors down at the front and if you've experienced that life-changing transformation, that the power of the gospel, and you want to be baptized coming up for our Christmas Eve services, that is fantastic. We'd love for you to come down and talk with them about that, and they'll help you get that scheduled. But if you've never experienced life change, I want to encourage you, come down front and tell them, I want to experience life change. I want the gospel to change my life. I want to apply the gospel and receive Jesus as my Savior. And they would love to talk with you about that. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the truth, the life-changing power of the gospel. Thank you that we can understand your word, but until we apply it to your, our lives, we don't really experience hope and change and we don't walk by faith. So Lord, help us all together to live by faith, to apply your word to our lives and seek after you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Father, for those in this room that may not yet have become a follower of Jesus, Lord, I pray that you would work in their heart, that you would give them the faith, that you would give them the courage to, to walk forward, to turn to somebody, maybe somebody in their life group, uh, maybe a pastor or maybe one of our prayer team and just say, hey, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. And Lord, we commit our time to you. We commit this, the rest of our service to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.